We get asked often about the different variations of information ratio. Here I'd like to share with you the two best definitions for the information ratio. The most common question we get on the forum about the information ratio is, which is the right one? And the answer is, there's more than one correct answer. And so that's why I'm showing you here a typical formula for the information ratio. And I like this one because it's simple, but more importantly, because it satisfies the rule of ratio consistency, which is one of the most important rules in finance for ratios, I think. And what do I mean by ratio consistency? Well, if we take return on equity, a common measure for banks, right? The numerator there might be net income or some variation on net income. And then we want to divide that by some measure, some balance sheet measure. And it's ratio consistent if the denominator is a capital, refers to capital holders who have a claim on net income. We wouldn't probably want to put total capital here because not all the capital holders have a claim on the net income. We want something more like common equity because they have a claim on net income and that would be ratio consistent. So ratio consistency is the guiding principle here for the two best versions of the information ratio. And I like this formula because symbolically it really shows that, right? The information ratio, after all, is a risk-adjusted performance measure, just like um, the ones I've been re uh, reviewing in the previous videos, risk-adjusted performance measure, which are measures of return per unit of risk. And that's what we have here in the numerator alpha as a measure of return. You hear about alpha all the time, especially in hedge funds. And we divide the alpha by the measure of risk. And here, notice the ratio consistency. The measure, the measure of risk is the standard deviation of alpha. So symbolically ratio consistent, and that'll be the guiding principle that informs the two best versions of the, ratio, of the information ratio that I'll look at right now. In order to do that, I've generated a random sample or simulation for a benchmark and a portfolio. So here's the benchmark. And I just have, I have a short, uh, small sample here, 36 months. So it's, I'm simulating three years of monthly returns, but to keep this uh, not, to reduce as much clutter here, I don't show uh, months four through 33, right? So I have a benchmark of returns, and then I have a portfolio. So the benchmark here could be a proxy for the market. And in my simulation, my benchmark average return is just above 2%. And then my portfolio return on this run happened to be 6%. So we have a series of benchmark returns and a series of portfolio returns. And then the most common information ratio is what I'm going to call the active information ratio because it's based on active returns, which are the most intuitive here probably, right? Each month we have the active return you can see is the portfolio's performance relative to the benchmark. So in my first month, the portfolio returned a very good 5.5% and the benchmark returned negative 2.5%. The portfolio minus the benchmark is 8%, and we call that an active return. And you can see each month we get a different active return. Here, my simulation has high volatility inputs, so my portfolio really um, experienced a shock here, a, a loss a third, so its active return is negative 23.8%. But we have a series here of 36 months, each itself, which is an active return. The average of those values is the portfolio's average active return over the period. So in the most common information ratio, that is the numerator, active return. And now to be ratio consistent, we can take that same series and you notice just in Excel, I'm taking a sample standard deviation of the series. So I have here the sample standard deviation 
or if you like the sample volatility, the sample monthly volatility of the active returns. And so these are ratio consistency if we divide them. And so the denominator here, that standard deviation of active returns, it is, it is fine to call that tracking error. When we see tracking error, um, it's used variously, but the most common interpretation of tracking error is active risk. So we can now define the most common information ratio because we're being ratio consistent, and that is active return divided by active risk. In my example, the active return is 3.96% because that's the standard, that's the average active return divided by the standard deviation of that same series of active returns. Really straightforward, right? And that, so that ratio is uh, 0.255, a completely valid information ratio. And hope you, hopefully you can see why now I've clarified that as by calling it the active information ratio because it's active return divided by active risk. Okay, now we can do another information ratio that's more technical. Maybe some purists would say this is the more correct way to do it because we're using an actual alpha. Notice I did not call the 3.96% an alpha. I called it an active return, an average active return. If we want to do the information ratio with uh, technically with alpha, then we're doing a residual information ratio. And in order to show you that, then I've put the um, on a scatter plot the portfolio versus the benchmark, and then I had Excel generate the ordinary least squared regression line for me. So that's in blue. And um, so a key thing about that regression formula is the intercept, because Alpha really is an intercept. And in this case, it's 1.83%. A little hard to see because I have such dispersion on my returns here. The intercept here is at 1.83%. And that's the true alpha because that's the uh, outperformance on the portfolio that is not correlated to the benchmark or that is not really explained by the benchmark. And here we have a high slope. A lot of it is explained. A lot of the movement here is explained by the, the um, benchmark. But my alpha is 1.83%. So you can see if I come down here to the regression of the residual information ratio, I have a regression slope of very high two, which is a function of here, what turned out to be in this sample of very high correlation, almost perfect correlation. And then I have my intercept alpha of 1.83%. And now to get the residual information ratio, I wanna divide that alpha in, in a ratio consistent way. And so the way to do that is if I come up here to my, simu my, my simulated returns, my active return, this column is the predicted return. So this column is giving me every month what the uh, return for the portfolio is if I used this regression line, right, or as predicted by the regression. So it's the predicted return. And then here we would have the portfolio's performance relative to the predicted return, which really is the difference, the vertical difference between each point and the regression line, right? So that's really the individual monthly alpha. You know, up here, for example, on this month, there's a really significant alpha. Uh, the, reg the re regression predicts a, predicts a portfolio return here on the line, but the actual portfolio is way up here um, for significant alpha per the month. But what we really have is a series of alphas. And then this um, average, by definition, by definition of the ordinary least squared regression needs to be zero. But this standard deviation of this series here is a, a measure of risk for our denominator. And it's very closely related here. It's going to be very close to the standard error of the regression. The only difference there is a, is a one degree of difference in the degrees of freedom, but actually these are otherwise 
almost uh, these are these numbers are otherwise approximations for each other, and either one would be valid in the denominator. But nevertheless, I'm going to use the standard error of the regression, not showing it on here, but it would be part of the regression output. And we can think of that as the volatility of the alpha. So if we have the standard error of the regression, then this residual information ratio, if we want to use the, the, uh, the true alpha here in the numerator, then we can divide it by the standard error of the regression, which approximates right the volatility of the alpha that is ratio consistent so that's either going to be the 9.89 or the 10.04 on the denominator so you can see down here then this information ratio which i'm calling residual is the alpha of 1.83 percent which again is the regression intercept divided by the volatility of that alpha where we can use either the 10.04 as the standard error of the regression, because we'll get that as the output. Or if we wanted to, it's just as valid to take the standard deviation of the actual monthly alphas, which is perfectly ratio consistent. So in this example, you can see that is one point, this ratio then is 1.83 divided by 10.04. It's, it's 0.182. And it's significantly less than our active information ratio. But it didn't surprise me on the sample because, right, our regression shows that a lot of this portfolio's performance is explained by the benchmark as evidenced by really what is a high beta or a high beta of 2.0 um, or high correlation. So the actual... Um, uh, re residual return or true alpha is lower. So this information ratio is lower. But my key point here is that either one of these are valid and these are the, probably the best two because they're ratio consistent. So I hope that's helpful.